When many speak of a highly competitive race with neck and neck competition, it is often described as a horse race, an image that is widely understood across cultures, but with very distinct connotations within each culture. But on June 9, 1973, when I was, wow, just coming out of the second grade, going into the third, winning for the first time the uh, prize for perfect attendance, a book that I got to read that summer, in a race that took only two minutes and 24 seconds, a world record and winning race for the Triple Crown, there was universally understood one meeting, an astounding victory. Hello, my name is Major Mike Webb, and the local papers would agree that nobody would credibly describe my race for Arlington Public School Board as a horse race. And back in 2016, one local journalist had observed about the congressional district that I am in that bookies wouldn't place odds on anyone other than a Democrat picking up the seat because victory for any other candidate was so far out of reach. And just about everyone understood what that meant in terms of the odds. But with the recent scandals arising after the Kentucky Derby, the recent running of the Preakness, and the looking forward to the deciding race in the Triple Crown at the Belmont Stakes, it is interesting to note the different cultures that those races cross for a national sporting event. Just the way that different regions within the United States view horses as a part of their own local cultures imports a lot of how fans of the Triple Crown might participate, even at each race. The traditions of the cowboys and ranches in the Southwest, where I bought my first real cowboy boots, is very distinct from the rolling hills and various horse farms in the Southeast, where I first learned in college the Shenandoah, in the Shenandoah, the word equestrian, a college major for young ladies at nearby Southern Sam and a little more distant Sweetbriar College, and where I first learned about and first drank my very first uh, mint jewel. When you're a Yankee from Frank Sinatra's Hudson County, very close to New York, your image of horses is very, very different, more likely than not, in a spin on a carousel with some music, maybe trying to catch the ring, or a story about somebody going to bet on the ponies at the track. And there, unlike the love for these elegant creatures that one might find throughout the South, up in New York, to be very honest, a horse is just a lottery ticket with legs. And unless you just enjoy the thrill of handing money over to a person behind a window, expecting nothing in return, most serious folks out at the races really don't care about the color of the horse. The colors that are on it and its jockey or even the color of the jockey, because the only thing that matters is winning. And you can only see that in the stats, the numbers. Unless, like one person I knew with incredible luck at the Meadowlands racetrack, who could even pick a donkey and expect the good graces of the Lord to deliver a jackpot win, one thing to look for is a winning record of success. If a horse has consistently won before, and clearly with the mob connections, if a horse has consistently won before, it is far more likely to win again. And especially if the horse has gotten to the Belmont Six, you can bet that it is not just there because somebody did it a favor or paid the man at the gate. And this rule is pretty much true in most of life. Consider, for instance, the case of two Virginia dockers. First meet Ralph. Ralph, as you probably know, grew up on a farm and hoping to leave that life and chase his dreams of success, he went off to a state college, albeit ranked lower than Liberty University by U.S. News and World Report. There's nothing outside the range of normal expectation. Farm boy, think about pharmaceuticals, goes off to college. Ralph managed to graduate from BMI and head off to a state medical college where apparently he loved attending costume parties. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, apparently even in medical school. 
albeit a medical school that most pre-meds in Virginia rank just above having to pursue their dreams of medicine by heading further south to Grenada. And again, not defying any great expectations on that career trajectory, Ralph was not offered a job at the Mayo Clinic to find the cure for cancer. He didn't open a lucrative practice in cosmetic surgery in California or become a brain surgeon like Ben Carson separating Siamese threats, but rather decided to join the Army, give it the old college try there. Is it a smashing success story? No, but it's an honest living. That's life. And when Ralph got to the rank of major, he decided to call being an Army surgeon quits to try to seek fulfillment of his American dream someplace else. Taking up a whole new field, pediatrics, bringing his passion and talents to healing sick kids, runny noses and straight knees, the challenge. It's a living, but then even that got old and so he decided to move off into Ahmed Norman Oliver, but now called Norman by his friends. The state health commissioner actually grew up in Motown Sound, Detroit. So perhaps he got an idea about pursuing medicine after viewing the comedy film Dr. Detroit starring Dan Aykroyd. We could only guess because, for unknown reasons, Norman decided he wanted to shake the dust off his feet in the Motor City and head off to State College in New York, the home of Saturday Night Live. It was a non-traditional college that requires no college entrance exam and with classes scheduled at hours to accommodate his work schedule in his other employments. But just as unlikely as someone just moving off from Detroit to New York City to work, then picking up college and night school, then Norm received some lucky break and got accepted to a top 20 medical college in Ohio, Case Western Reserve. His ship had finally come in and armed with a top medical college degree, complemented by a residency in Cleveland, Norm's career trajectory far exceeded the opportunities that may have been available to Ralph at his far less competitive medical school. But perhaps Norm found Jesus or just wanted to pay forward, and he abandoned great fame and fortune right there to go to work with Eskimos in Alaska, practicing family medicine. Why would anyone do that? We cannot say. But somehow the folks at the University of Virginia found him in that igloo and brought him aboard to become a department head at their medical college. And not just as a teacher, setting the stage for him to ascend to his current position as the Virginia Department of Health. But if you were a bookie placing a bet on a horse, it would be far easier, based on the track record, to bet on Ralph and where he would land. Lacking the consistency in Norm's track record, it's just the inconsistency. Ralph, easy bet. Norm, long shot, kind of dicey. And in a once in a lifetime pandemic, as described by Mark Herring, the state attorney general in courts, both Norm and Ralph had to take another gamble on a novel coronavirus with no track record to examine, or very little. It's brand new. Just rely on dumb luck, but with the assurance of their training in medicine to know at least some principles to guide them while they negotiate an uncertain path. Law of large numbers, statistics, results. Or at least that would have been the expectation. But not for some early fumblings by Norm, especially. The doctor with the less consistent record of success. But who Ralph yet had chosen as his top doctor and continued to keep him on. Even after he appeared to be having problems, even understanding tracer contacts back in May and June and their role in prevention and mitigation of disease, as reported by the press. And delivering saline solution instead of high demand vaccines even made the national news. But apparently the president and the CDC have indicated that regardless both Ralph and Norm have weathered the storm, and the pandemic is finally, as they say, nearing an end. Or is it? Still, there remains one big problem, and that is the novel coronavirus that became a pandemic pathogen, with a validated less than 5% infectious that's secondary attack rate, a level that even CDC 
had said, at least some years ago, was not sufficient to sustain a pandemic. In fact, a number that indicated that the pandemic was already gone before it began. If you had to ask medical researchers considering social distancing as a means to combat future pandemics in 2005, they would have told you that the pathogen with the best track record to bet on was H1N1, the avian flu, that had produced four more pandemics after the Spanish flu of 1918. The sudden emergence of five bat coronaviruses that had reportedly zoonotically evolved from Chinese bats between 2003 and 2005 did not alter the betting odds for them. Even with the worldwide publicity achieved by SARS that had made headlines from Hong Kong in 2003. Even the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in 2010 under the Obama administration, contingency planning for a pandemic next time and testing PPE substitutes to provide non-essential persons were betting on the avian flu, H1N1, and not a novel coronavirus. Did the 2012 outbreak of MERS on the Arabian Peninsula alter somehow the winning potential of coronaviruses? Scientists examining it, even the CDC, have agreed that it primarily, if not exclusively, was limited to nosocomial or hospital settings and appeared to require extended exposures in close contact not a highly contagious disease by a long shot. But most intriguing about MERS was the fact that it had definitely evolved from a bat coronavirus, similar to the bat coronavirus from which SARS had sprung. But the most direct link on the Arabian Peninsula was found in dromedary camels as the source. And perhaps different sanitary conditions are present on the Arabian Peninsula. And perhaps there is not, it is not unexpected to see a camel racing through a hospital world. Maybe they're doing camel jockey races in the hospitals on the Arabian Peninsula. I cannot say. Setting off deadly infection outbreaks, but there were no dromedary camels running around in South Korea. And that is where MERS found its greatest damage just three years later in 2015. And Recently, Dr. Northam indicated that he neither considered the possibility that the current pandemic pathogen, now on its way out, was not a natural occurrence, nor at any time thereafter, as is normal standard operating procedure, at least in the military, did he do an in-progress review to make sure that it had not been weaponized at a later point. So are you a betting man? If you could be shared, and if you could turn back time, would you bet on the sure thing avian flu to win the triple crown sweepstakes as the pandemic next time? Or would you bank the whole role on a novel coronavirus, a virus that has a pathology that simply does not sound natural, like a Rosie Perez winning the New York Marathon? And coming off the back stretch, it's Avion Flu, H1N1, ahead by eight lengths. Coming off the final turn, it's Avion Flu, H1N1, leading by 10 lengths, just like Secretariat in her victory over Sham in the Belmont Stakes. In the final stretch, H1N1 continues to widen the lead to 31 lengths, while her closest competitor falls back with the rest of the pack. And at the finish, it's, it's novel coronavirus wins the triple crown by a new. And there's a not to learn gallons who got that. This briefing was unclassified. My name is Major Mike Webb, and by God, I am running for the Arlington Public School Board. Let's keep Mike Webb away from our schools. Honest. This advertisement was authorized by Mike Webb.